Hey everyone, it's been a while, um, a couple weeks since we had a live show. James and I, two weeks ago, were in wine country in Paso Robles, or Paso Robles, depending on how you say it, and also the Santa Ynez Valley, which is in the Central Coast area. Those were gorgeous. Um, and hopefully we get to do a wine cruise at some point in time where we can at least visit the Santa Barbara County, Santa Ynez Valley wineries, which would be amazing. But we're back. And today we have um, Mickey from Icy Straight Point who's going to talk about Alaska with us. Um, this should be awesome because I really wish... I was in Alaska right now. Well, maybe not right now. How cold, how cold is it there right now, Mickey? Well, I'm looking out my deck and I can see snow, snow, snow everywhere. Uh, we were at high of like 27 degrees yesterday here in the lovely town of Juneau. So uh, and when last, last Sunday we had 22 inches of snow. Spectacular. See, okay, see, I was told maybe it's just catch a can. Catch a can, they don't get a lot of snow, correct? Well, it really depends on the on, on the year. For example, okay. here in Juneau, we don't normally get a lot of snow. Our air temperature is really controlled by the sea temperature. And so we get this bubble that's created. And so the sea temperature is a constant 53 degrees. So when you cruise to Alaska, a lot of people ask me, does this water freeze over in the winter? And the answer for that is no, it doesn't. It actually controls our air temperature. So usually a, a below 1800 feet, we're getting rain most of the time. So we don't get a lot of snow traditionally. So like when you cruise into uh, like Juneau and you see the Juneau ice field up on the very top, that starts at around 2200 feet. And that's where it's constantly getting snow all winter and not rain. But you move down into lower elevations at sea level and we're getting a lot of rain. That's why Ketchikan is world famous for the rainiest place. They say the rainiest place in Alaska, but that's not really true, just so you know. Um, Yakutat gets slightly, I think about a half an inch more than, than Ketchikan, but it's not on a cruise route. So uh, it becomes I, the, the, the rainiest port. Uh, but if you go back the last three seasons, uh, it's been a drought in Alaska. So we really had didn't have any rain uh, we did have a rainy summer this year, but unfortunately, we're going to alt control delete this season. So, okay, yeah. So, uh, it's, catch a can. That, that's what my backdrop is today. Lovely. I'll forgive you. <laughs> well, now we're going to move on to news quick, and then we'll get back to Alaska um, news items today. My gosh, there are so many. I'm going to start off and talk about Norwegian and you know, CEO Frank Del Rio says they're, you know, excited. There's still a lot of things that they got to learn in order to get, you know, for the nuances of how to execute these new orders, which there are 74 recommendations from the CDC. So there's a lot of stuff that has to be figured out. And, um, so they got to figure that they don't consider it a race because they want to have a hundred percent right. They want to get it right the first time. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is there's this company called Ocean Builders, which is taking the former PO cruise ship um, and making it become what are let's see, it was the Pacific Dawn, and now it's going to become. The Satoshi, Satoshi um, after the owner and inventor of Bitcoin, because everything on the ship you'll have to pay Bitcoin for. I don't, I never understand the Bitcoin stuff, but yeah, anyway. So it's going to have a total of 77 cabins on board. It'll start to be auctioned off November 5th. What? That was already passed. I don't, they didn't do that yet. Um, at least not that I'm aware of because they were talking about it yesterday. Um, so basically they look forward to re uh, creating a hub of technology and innovation in Panama and prices start from the sale run from November 5th to 28th and include 200 inside cabins um, and they start between 25,000 and 50,000. 
and they'll become full owners of their cabins indefinitely, though they'll have to pay a monthly fee for operating expenses. So he thinks um, around 700 and what is it? 777 cabins that will be able to accommodate 2020 people. And they plan on doing more cruise ships that are buying more that will not be running again and doing this throughout the world, but they haven't listed any other places. I just think that's kind of interesting. I would do it, but not in Panama. Panama right now has the highest rate of COVID in COVID cases per capita per 1 million people. But there's my news story. James, do you have anything today? Well, I, I think that uh, the, the first one is the fact that okay. it looks, my gut tells me, and I, I'd be interested, Mickey, to see your perspective on this, but I feel like the 2021 cruise season for Alaska is going to be the the cash cow that a lot of brands hope that they can they can recover and put money back on their balance sheets. But it looks like the capacity is, it continues to increase for 2022. For instance, uh, Royal Caribbean released yesterday, they have uh, two Quantum class ships and two Radiance class ships going to be up there, which is a uh, compared to only uh, one quantum class for this season, upcoming season. So I kind of wonder if it's going to be one of these crashes where they send so much capacity to Alaska that instead of being able to command a premium, ultimately we get really, really good affordable uh, cruises up in Alaska in, in for the 2022 season. But I guess we'll we'll kind of see what uh, happens on that. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on that, Mickey? Well, I, I think it actually is a trend that we kind of predicted, which is if you look at some of the mi mitigation factors that they're trying to implement, it makes a lot of sense to take some of these smaller ships that are probably not uh, as fuel efficient, don't have as many cabins, and say instead of selling uh, a ship that we'd have to sell full to become profitable, we can take a larger ship put half the number of guests into it and still run more efficiently, more cost effective, and also allow people to have more social distance space on, on the ship. And so I think that that might be a trend that, that will continue. We kind of thought at, at IC Straight Point as we looked at, at our season that that made a lot of sense. We, we knew some quantum class ships were starting to move uh, in other places around the world and it looked like that we might find them in Alaska. Um, I don't know about the cruise fare though. Uh, because right now bookings are up and so it's a good time to book and they a lot of the cruise lines just released also their 2022 season well, that, that, that's and so uh, the Royal Caribbean it's a 2022 yeah uh, well we we suspect there'll be some movement in 2021 um, and you'll see a lot a lot of newer larger ships coming this direction I, I suspect but uh, I also also think that um, you're going to see bookings are up so I think on our announcement call for a port of the year, Lisa Lutoff said 21% over 2019 for, for the Alaska season. Um, I know that uh, Royal's experiencing the same. So I think, I think there's a lot of, a lot of people that are just tired of being uh, cooped up and they're ready to come to a place like Alaska where everything's larger in Alaska and including their own personal space, you know? So uh, and so I think that trend is going to kind of continue is how do we get uh, larger ships, more spacing, more individual spaces. And then also how do we go into ports that allow guests to experience Alaska while still social distancing, like Icy Street Point. So, so you, your, your view is, is more that the, the limitations are the, the capacity available as opposed to uh, as opposed to cost or, or demand in, in general. So basically, the, the more ships you can put up there, the more ships they can fill. Um, well, I, I think it's just going to be a balance, right? Because uh, also Alaska is a very unique place. And, and as you know, there's a, a limited number of ports. So uh, and Alaska, although a big place, there are many ports that only can have capacity to three, you know, three ships maximum, four ships, uh, Juno being the exception to that. But then you really don't want to put Juno has a six ship capacity. You don't really want to overfill that particular location, meaning that we're trying to social distance and create bubbles around individual ships is my understanding. Um, and as we know, this all can change it, right? So in COVID time, we, we, there's a lot of time ahead of us. Um, so this all can change, but 
Uh, I think it, when people start to see these mitigation factors start to work on other ships, you know, we start doing these test runs that will start into the private islands and then expand. And I think, uh, you know, you quoted Frank Del Rio and, and I'll quote his uh, right hand man, uh, Howard Sherman, executive vice president at Seattle, who said that in our, our press conference that they believe that they'll be standing ships up uh, individually one at a time. I mean, they're not going to bring back all ships in the entire fleet at one point as as they become successful in one particular area, then they'll stand another ship up. So it's kind of a staggered approach was his, to quote him directly, a staggered approach in standing up these ships. And I think that hopefully by the time we get to April that we, I, you know, it's, it's hard to predict what, what it's going to be, but we're, we're hopeful, you know, Alaska, like many places around the world, including Huna and Icy Strait Point, you know, we really rely on the cruise ship traffic. You know, that's 90, 90% plus of uh, our economic revenue driver for the community is to tours. So it's really, really important. And all of the communities around uh, Southeast Alaska are really hurting because of the lack of tourism. So we're really hopeful that, you know, we want to get back, but we want to get back to health, you know, healthily safe for to be healthy and safe for the guest. And that those mitigation factors and all the other things that are in the works come together kind of like uh, the, I don't know. Is it okay to say with a ship, the perfect storm? <laughs> I mean, well, when it comes to all comes together at the right time in the right place uh, for all of Alaska. I, I, I saw Titanic on a uh, on a you know NBC or CBS whatever broadcast feed while I was watching on a cruise ship. So apparently, you, you know, and I were watching the same thing. I was on a ship watching that as well. I, something I don't know. I didn't feel good about it, but it had a whole different meaning. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do. I do think that uh, Alaska is going to be where people want to be. I mean, it it is a trend that you know we saw uh, significant growth around fourteen uh, percent over the last uh, decade, and uh, I think that that's going to continue across the cruise industry for for Alaska. It might take us a little while to get back there, but Alaska is a destination that really will change your life. I like to say there there are destinations around the world that that will really really have an impact. And Alaska is one of those places as you sail through, you're sailing through, you know, time and glaciers and history. And it really is one of those places that people come to and will keep desiring. We, we find now that, you know, more people are on Zoom, that people are really hungry for real. And I think that's the real news is that the more real it is, um, the more authentic um, we, we have, there's a, a phrase that's going around, which is called, uh, you know, themed reality. So we were surrounded by realities that have been themed and people want to break out of the theme reality. And I think Alaska is one of those great places to do that. Well, you know, talk, talking about the uh, reality, I just, just want to say, you know, shout out to the guys who are watching us. You know, thank you, David. Um, and uh, also through uh, Mikhail up there before, thank you, really appreciate you guys. Uh, if anyone watching us has questions for, uh, for Mickey or I guess myself or Heather too, but Mickey's the expert here. Um, you know, feel free to post a comment and we'll be able to uh, ask uh, and answer it. Yeah, and I, I don't know if I can just give a shout out too. We are here broadcasting live, you know, uh, for our military troops and people in the military for today. So Veterans Day, very important. And I, I saw that you actually said thank you to my dad for watching. There you go. Um, well, and I, I wasn't uh, sure if that was your dad or just the guy who shares a lot your last name. So uh, oh, yeah, that, th th thanks, Dad. But also thank you, my brother, who served our, in our, our armed services, so in the army. Thank you very much. And and thank you to my father who served as well. So and, and everybody else. Now yeah. going, I have some questions. I I totally have been telling people they're like, oh, well, cruising can wait. I said it can't. We've got towns that depend on cruising tourism all around the world is hurting so bad right now you know yes if you can drive somewhere yes it's it's been beneficial to those people but a lot of places you can only fly to or get to by cruise and those places are hurting so we really need people to do their best so we can get this under control and get back to doing these items but one question i have for you is like in Key West, they noticed the water when cruising and people stopped coming and even doing their own boats because of COVID. The ocean got became different in the waters around in the in the bays and stuff. How how is what what's nature like there now because of no cruising 
Yeah, are bears just walking down the street more than usual, or <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> this is one of my favorite all-time questions that uh, we've received during the during this COVID period, and that's because Icy Street Point is known for the largest group of humpback whales and coastal brown bears of anywhere that you can go see in the world. And so we have 1.3 bears for every square mile is what the Forest Service tells us. So when you say, do we see more bears, it's really hard to compare between 1.3 and 1.5. I mean, it's it's that it's we we have bears that uh, roam through town that are down the roads. Um, but actually, in a lot of this year, uh, I noticed that we had less whales and we were out and I, I wondered if they just missed all those tourists coming to see them. It's like, where are these guys? I know they're here somewhere. They just are not showing themselves. Um, it, you know, we have somewhere between uh, around 200 whales that stretch between the Pacific and Icy Street Point. Um, so you have about 64 miles of water that call, they call home. And it really comes that their home because of the water that's coming off of Glacier Bay. That's nutrient rich water that glacier, that the, the whales just love. It attracts the smaller plankton, the krill. And so that's why they, they call that place home. It's we had one of the rainiest seasons on record. Actually, I have to go back into the 40s. And so I wonder if we, we invited more rain because we didn't have as many guests. Uh, but we didn't we noticed uh, we noticed a lot more bears. But that that actually is in, in Juneau. But that's really a misnomer because what happens is bears are very, very unique. And the fact that they predict the weather in the future. So when they are getting ready to to mate, they decide whether or not they're going to fertilize the females, whether they're going to fertilize the eggs based on the weather in the future that they predict. So if they predict a good summer ahead, they might have instead of one cup, they might have two. And it was really quite funny. For a long time, we believed that bears could only have two cubs. That was all that they could ever have. And then we went into this drought period where we had bears that were having four cubs. And we're like, wow, four cubs, that's not possible. We thought that, in fact, there were some Park Service people that believed that a mother bear adopted another cub. And if you know anything about mother bears, you'll be like, no, I don't believe that one. That's not, that can't be, right? But what they've done is they're predicting this good weather. So what we've had is really coming into this summer, three years of phenomenal bear-friendly weather. And so we've had lots and lots more bear cubs that have been born. Well, you have other issues that are coming into effect, like the, the whale, whale population is going up. Uh, they love salmon fry, uh, overfishing in China, uh, and Asian waters affect the amount of salmon that are returning. Um, this then cuts down on food sources for bears. So if bears don't have those natural food sources that they've been accustomed to, their population is up, and then you get, uh, you know, more baby bears that are born, they're going to go look for places to eat. And unfortunately, you know, we, we have where we've had more incidents of, of bears uh, breaking into trash cans. And there's a very funny clip, you'll have to look it up, uh, of a bear that goes into a convenience store uh, about three blocks from my house here. And he walks into the store and he takes out uh, – peanut butter cups, Reese's peanut butter cups, clears out the entire shelf of just Reese's and walks out the door. It's a very funny clip, but it's real. It's not, it's, it's very real, but that has to do with lack of food sources uh, and number of increase in bears. And we've found bears around Alaska that used to be, people think like they only eat salmon. That's really not true. Uh, a lot of bears have become complete vegetarians where they're eating grasses, roots, and berries throughout the year. Um, and that's what they eat all the way up to salmon season. They, they then gorge themselves, usually if they're long salmon, salmon runs. So they're in salmon season. Um, I was going to ask about the fishing because we were there two years ago and there was a ban on one type king of salmon. king, king, king salmon, salmon, right? Yeah. Is there still a ban on it um, or because of the waters coming from yeah. Asia? No, it, it all it, goes or? back to what we do. What we do, and this is why salmon tastes so good in Alaska, is that there are no farm salmon at all. They're they're fish that are returning back to their natural habitats, and so what's happening is we every year Fish and Game does samples of what the return rate is. And while you might have been an area where kings were not allowed to be fished, there might have been another area in Alaska that was open to king fishing. 
And so, and it just depends on the season and where the return is at. So we'll see our fishing fleets will move to where those fishing grounds are open for that particular season. It's a way like we do with forest, like forest, forestry management that we're really manage, managing the, the fish and the fish return uh, to protect those salmon runs. Now we do also in Alaska, we take and we harvest uh, salmon eggs and then we go and we populate creeks. Now I could really go crazy on this. I don't want to geek out too much, but um, they've done some really cool things. They've discovered in Alaska, for example, changing the temperature of the water of the salmon eggs will change the jaw color of the, of the salmon. Interesting. So, so it allows them to determine which hatchery and what salmon runs have been successful. So they can then go back and populate the same area. So there's, I mean, like I said, you could really geek out on that, but um, I'll try to spare you that <laughs> this morning. I was going to, well, let's get into the cruise stuff. So Icy Straight Point, uh, the first time I heard about it was about a year and a half ago from Norwegian. Um, tell us a little bit about it and where exactly is Icy Straight Point located? Uh, so Icy Straight Point is on Icy Straight, which is the body of water. So kind of like when you were back at home, you have street names, every every channel and canal and, and Alaska has a name. And the major strait, you know, strait is a body of water, uh, a, a channel that creates, connects two major bodies of water. And so George Vancouver named it a strait because it was so massive. And he named it Icy Strait because there was so much ice coming out of Glacier Bay that he couldn't pass through it. So uh, an icy straight point really sits uh, across the channel, just south of Glacier Bay, about 30 miles uh, to the west of, of Juneau. And it sits on Chickakoff Island, which is uh, also one of the largest uh, still existing Alaska Native Clinket communities in all of Alaska. The port itself really start, started in, in 2004. And this year we're very, very excited to, because of our work and expansion of our new wilderness landing dock in 2019, uh, we were awarded this year Sea Trade Support of the Year. So this is a global recognition being out Russia and uh, St. Petersburg, Russia and Dover, e England for the award, uh, which happened uh, last month. So, uh, do, do you have that video that you showed um, off the air? Is that is that working the, so people can see kind of yeah. where it is, juxtaposition everything else? Yeah, well, Heather had asked a question pre-show about, uh, you know, I always think about when you're cruising to Alaska, how you're going to get here. And there are really three main core routes that you can come and visit Alaska which are, we have what we call the, the round trip, the round trippers, which are those that are going from Seattle or Vancouver. So you go up and back in seven days. And then we also have what we refer to as the open jaws, the northbound southbound runs, which go from either uh, mostly actually out of Vancouver and you, or sailing south from Seward, but you go seven days sailing all the way up. And then most people get off and do the interior. So I, I thought, um, you know, my favorite route to go is, is out of Vancouver. I know that it can be, people look at it and say it can be a little bit more costly, but it, it's worth, uh, and I, I really, if you really compare the numbers, uh, especially with the Canadian dollar, you're really doing pretty good. Um, and it's just much more spectacular of a trip. So I thought I would share that with you uh, today, uh, share that route and kind of talk you through um, the experience. I'll see if I can do this here. And, and while Mickey is setting that up, uh, yes, we've been talking about Seattle. Yes, we've been talking about Vancouver. And clearly those are like 99.99% of the cruises. My heart is absolutely set on doing a, the 14-day out of um, Los Angeles next year or possibly doing the uh, one of the ones out of San Francisco. Because I think that would be an amazing opportunity, especially in the beginning of the season next year where there's still some – I'm I'm a geek. I'm a nerd. I, maybe I'm crazy, but I would feel more safe on a cruise ship than I would traveling through an airplane in airports. And so being able to do 14 days out of Los Angeles uh, versus having to pay for airfare up to uh, Seattle and then having to pay for a hotel in Seattle and that kind of stuff just seems like an amazing opportunity. So it's really cool seeing the various um, other ports of departure that, that are emerging. Yeah, and I'd also add, I, I always like to tell people when you come to Alaska, it, you really need to figure out what your big five is, the five reasons that you're really coming, because that will determine when you sail. And I always get in this argument, a very good friend of mine, Tony, is a pilot for Taku uh, Wings Airways, which flies over the Taku Glacier and Taku Lodge. 
spectacular flight, but he and I get in this argument every season about whether it's best to come in the middle of summer when the salmon are running or whether it's best to come in the spring when you get the, the contrast of the snow-capped mountains and you see the fresh snow. Because if you wait until July and you think you're going to see lots of snow on the mountain in July, you won't see it because it's mostly melted away except for the glaciers. So it really depends on what you want to see. That's another thing. I, As a travel advisor, I have a lot of people always ask me when the best time to go is. And I said, well, first of all, the best time to go is when you can afford to go. <laughs> yeah. Because prices do vary quite a bit on season. And I say, what do you want to see? Um animals are more out in the summer, but aren't they only in mornings? How is the... Uh, no, it really, it really depends on, for example, I like to say, you know, if like, let's say your big five is bears and you okay. come in and you come in May. Uh, well, you come in May, the bears are really working their way from the highlands and the mountains down. And so they're eating the berries in the brush and they're very hard to see. Whereas once the salmon start to run, then the bears are moving down into the creeks and into the open areas. And these are the areas that you're gonna guarantee 100% bear sightings. So if, you're, if you wanna see one of those 1600 pound coastal big male brown bears, you're gonna have to wait until June and end of July to really guarantee it the last two weeks of July. Then, but let's say for example, you're a whale lover, there's no bad time the whales are gonna be out but the other thing to know is that when the spring, when they're all migrating from Hawaii, you get these very large groups that move together. And so that's a really cool thing when you get whales that are in pods of more than 20, 25, 30 whales in an individual group moving together, feeding together. And you're only going to get that in May. So if you're like, I want to see crazy number of whales. I mean, at Icy Strait Point, we usually get large groups, you know, uh, 10, 12 that are moving together throughout the season. We have these uh, bubble net feeding groups that, that come and we see them consistently throughout the summer. But for me, you know, you have her herring spawning and the whales just love that. They all move together as they come out of Hawaii. And it's just a, a great time to see also the snow caps. So May is a better time, you know, the, those early runs. Also, we like to say, you know, those shoulder seasons for some people, if you can get out before the school schools get out traditionally is also a good value time as well to come to Alaska. How about uh, the fall? Is there any, uh, people always ask me if you can see Northern Lights or when does it get dark in the fall or those kinds yes. of things? Yes. So we start sliding, the season starts to change, you know, as we start to move into the end of August, we start to lose light at about five minutes per day. Um, however, we also start to lose cruise ships. Cruise ships start to migrate to other places in the world. And so we get larger, uh, we get basically ships that have fewer, fewer ships competing with them for experiences and spaces. So traditionally. Um, however, it's been said that uh, you move into the fall and you're more likely to get rain. However, you know, the last few years prior to the 2020 season, uh, that was not true. We had some of the most spectacular weather into September. Uh, the other thing that I hear a lot is people say, I want to see northern lights. And when you come to Alaska, um, I don't know, I think there's a ship oh, out there, yeah. a ship out there that put in a northern lights theater. And, and that, just, that just fanned the fever, right? fan the flame and that is because people really want to see northern lights and i can tell you one of the highest rated cruises in in alaska cruise history was on a rare occasion in september late september when we had northern lights that was only visible in the chatham strait which is the channel that goes from skagway south to icy strait and the captain uh saw the northern lights it was about 2 30 in the morning he paused the ship and when you're on the bridge and worked on the bridge of ships many, many times, the one button you're afraid to push is the one that says all, because that announces everything to the entire ship into the staterooms. And you're like, this better be good. If this isn't good, I'm not going to press that button. Um, but the captain pressed the call button and uh, he basically said, I don't care who you are. Get up. The show is unbelievable. And he shut the lights on the upper decks off and turned the ship off and sat there and became one of the high, it is is known as the highest rate, rated cruise in history into Alaska. But that's a very rare thing that you're going to see. You know. um, so if you want to see Northern Lights, I always tell people, you know, there's no bad time to come to Alaska because every time you come, it's going to be a different experience. 
And I guess that kind of also leads us to, to my little map because really, if you want to see Northern Lights, you want to go up into the interior and that's into the Fairbanks Denali and where they have in the winter time, uh, you know, you have Northern Lights nearly 80% uh, plus during the, during the winter months. So, um, but uh, I'll, I'll switch back over here to my map and we'll go back to Vancouver just real quickly. So as you can see, this is uh, this is uh, Alaska, and it, it stretches all the way. I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but uh, it stretches all the way up into Seward. It's a very very far north port. Uh, what I'll share with you today is a little bit of a northbound route that goes out of Vancouver. Uh, one of the reasons I like going out of Vancouver is because you're on the inside of Vancouver Island. So Vancouver itself is just a, a really beautiful port uh, known as the sails. Uh, you sail out and under, underneath the Lionsgate Bridge and you sail into a, a place called Georgia Strait. Now, if you're doing a round trip cruise, you'll see here, if you're doing the northbound, you end up into what's called Campbell River and into the Ripple Rock area after dark and into what's known as Johnstone Strait, named after James Johnstone. But when you're doing the northbound, southbound round trip out of Vancouver, you're gonna find yourself picking up the pilot there at the Canadian Pilot Station about three o'clock in the afternoon in which case you sail the Johnstone Strait uh, all the way uh, during the daylight, which is fantastic. So as you pass Prince Rupert, though, this is really kind of the boundary, the north end of where Canada ends and you're entering into U.S. waters. And you basically enter into what's called the Tongass Narrows. And at Tongass Narrows, you're into Ketchikan. So this is kind of one of those traditional uh, last ports or first ports because of its connection and distance from from uh, Seattle or Vancouver and when you're doing the northbound run it is the first stop and once again I do like this northbound because you're going to pass a place during daylight uh, guard lighthouse to the very north end um, you'll go up Camp Clarence Strait and this is really an icy Strait point teaser into the evening time uh, and I, it says Sunday there this is uh, basically a millennium run out of Vancouver celebrity run and you go out and go into a place called Snow Passage. Snow Passage also has a very high uh, concentration of humpback whales, and it also funnels the water right down on the channel. So the whales migrate to that lo location, and it's a great spot to get a teaser. You're up on the big ship, so you don't really get to see them as well. Uh, but then also you wake up in the morning, and you're in Chatham Strait, sailing north towards Icy Strait, and you're going to round that corner, uh, Point Augusta, and into Icy Strait, point into, into the daylight. And then you'll, you'll get into the port of Icy Street Point. You'll be able to see the Zip Rider. And now in 2020, uh, 21, you're going to be able to see the new gondola system that goes up towards the mountain. So that's also kind of gives you a perspective as where Icy Street Point is in the itinerary. You can see that you're just cruising 82 miles over what's called a point retreat and into the Gastineau Channel and straight up into Juneau. Uh, you arrive early in the morning in this northern route. Most ships into Juneau, because of the distances, are relatively short. You arrive very early and you have a long port day in Juneau, both in Juneau, actually, and in Icy Street Point. You can see Taku River, and even by satellite, you'll see how that, that glacial water is flowing out. You can see the color of the, of the image, uh, the water there. Juneau is also very famous uh, for the fact that, uh, you know, Gold Town, based around uh, turn of the century, the Gold Rush, uh, but also it has one of the most accessible glaciers in all the world called the Mendenhall Glacier. Uh, Mendenhall Glacier is roughly about uh, 14 miles north of the ship. I uh, highly recommend if you come to Juneau, that's one thing you have to do. Uh, then you're going to sail in really short distances, again, 116 miles north. And you'll retrace your steps down the Gastineau Channel. Uh, this Shelter Island area, this is if you go whale watching uh, on the ship. That's another area, Shelter Lincoln. That's the place to be out watching for whales. A very, very great, great spot. And then, of course, uh, you'll pass Haines along the way and on the what's called the Lynn Canal, uh, which connects you up into, into Skagway. Skagway is very, very vertical port. Once again, it based around the, the gold rush um, turn of the time period, but they also have the White Pass Railway. And that's one thing I would really like to emphasize, too. As you come to Alaska, you really want to think about um, how each port is unique and different and how to capitalize on that. Like we say, Juneau is the ice port. Uh, Icy Street Point is uh, Clinkett and Family Port. Lots of activities to do together, whales, bears, um, Skagway. Then you, as you head out, you're gonna pass out in Glacier Bay. Some ships go into Glacier Bay. It does have limited sailings into Glacier Bay based on itineraries and ships. Um, 
But for those who don't go to Glacier Bay, they either go to a place called uh, Tracy Arm Fjord, Endicott Arm, or into my favorite, which is up here on the northbound, southbound runs, uh, which is called Hubbard Glacier. Uh, it's into Yakutat, Disenchantment Bay. And this particular area is uh, the largest tidewater glacier, meaning a glacier that ends in the sea. It's calving. Uh, it has a very long, very long uh, collection zone, as we call it. So 70, over 70 miles that it runs down, uh, roughly 76 miles, actually, that it runs down and collects snow. So it's a very, very active glacier. It's the most impressive glacier I've seen around the world, even if you go to South America. Uh, into Beagle Channel, Glacier Alley. There's nothing that compares to Hubbard Glacier. It's really three glaciers, the Turner, Valerie, and Hubbard that join together. And right there at Point Gilbert, it calves. Uh, I mean, you can set your watch uh, about every minute. It's giving off some ice, uh, and it's spectacular. 400-foot ice fires there. And then that, of course, then connects you across the Gulf of Alaska and into the, the lovely port of Seward. And Seward is uh, is really one of the is the most northern port, and that's where people are on the northbound, southbound, are then connecting by the Alaska Alaska Railway, and up into Anchorage, or you can also continue the journey in, into the very famous national park, Denali, and uh, that is probably you know when we talk about lifetime journeys, that's definitely one of one of those spots. So that's the little whirlwind tour. I want to go now. Yes, me too. <laughs> me too. And Mickey, I, I found uh, it looks like there's actually quite a few, considering how rare it is, videos of the Aurora uh, from cruise ships. So I have one from October 1st, 2010 that I wanted to uh, throw up there for people who... Yeah, James, before you do that, I might mention, remember the time of the year. Remember the time of the year. So it's going to be late in the season. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, 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 certainly. Yeah. And that, that, that's definitely something that um, I think Heather and I saw the Aurora uh, um, back in um, uh, North Dakota, but it was at basically at the horizon level. So seeing something like this would be absolutely amazing. And this is on a princess ship, yep. by the way. Yeah. Spectacular. Uh, one thing to also know is if you see a little bit of movement, meaning you're looking up in the sky and you say, I think there's something moving there. There might be something. You turn your camera on and your camera lens actually picks up that green a lot better than your eye does. So a lot of times you get more spectacular show through your camera than you will by, by the naked eye if it's a light showing. Especially if you're shooting in raw colors. <laughs> we would never do that. Come on, James. Uh, Another question. Yeah, well, no, it, 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 it's amazing. I, the, the, I mean, the stuff we saw in, in, in North Dakota was kind of like a, let's say, an amuse bouche. You know, it, it, was, it was enough to be like, hey, say, hey that's pretty cool. Let, let's, get this, let's get this show on the road. But, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing what these guys are seeing. And, and frankly, it's, it's, Based on the volume of, of videos across you know a number of years, it looks like there's there's opportunities almost every year. But if you think about the number of cruises that are there, the number of days you know over a uh, you know let's say what like late September and October, so you're looking at a month and a half, uh, it's certainly a rare occurrence. Yeah, and I and I would also say that you you have to realize that you as I like to say put yourself in the in the path of opportunity. Meaning that if you are on one of those lake crews, the number of people who usually see it are very small because 90% of the ship is asleep because the captain won't press the all call button, right? So uh, you, if you really want to, yeah, you, you, if you really want to see it, you got to be out there, find the darkest part part of the ship uh, to go find it. The other option is to come back to Alaska after your cruise. Many people do this; they fall in love with Alaska and they come back and they come back, and you know you make a run up in the winter time. Uh, Fairbanks is known to have Northern Lights more than 80% of the time. Uh, my wife and I are going to make this run here uh, the day after Christmas on what's called the Winter Express, which is that dome train that runs from Anchorage uh, into Fairbanks. And so you also have to remember seasons, right? Because Alaska has a lot of daylight. And in the opposite seasons, the winter seasons, we have a lot more night, which is going to increase the darkness, increase your chances of seeing Northern Lights. Sure. One question I have as a travel advisor, ooh, a lot of feedback there. One question I have is I get 
asked if they go later in season, are things going to be closed or is there still going to be everything open for them to do? No, there's no bad time to come to Alaska. There's no so bad time. Like, excursions will still be going on. And yes, everything like is going to still be happening. The one exception that we've had uh, the last, ooh, I want to say two years, was because of the lack of snowfall, because we were in a drought, we wouldn't have had the problem this year at all. But the dog sledding, heli, 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 helicopter to the top of the, the glaciers were cut a little bit early for dog sledding. Because what they do is they bring those famous Alaska Huskies and they set up these amazing dog camps on top of the glaciers. And what the dogs are doing is they're running on, on the seasoned snow that's at the top of the glacier. And once that melts away, they, can know, they can't run on glacier ice. It's, it's not suitable for dog sledding. So they basically pack the camps up. So if that's something your heart is set on, you know, may, you may not want to go on the last run of the season. Um, you know, that is one of the, the, the higher end. I like to say if you're in Alaska, though, you need to spoil yourself. So uh, that would be one of those spoil trips um, to go and run with the dogs on top of the glacier. But, the, but also the other alternative, too, which I like even more, because usually what happens is you go dog sledding and one person in the family really loves dogs. The rest are there is, is you know along for for support, emotional support. Oh, the dogs! I love the dogs. But then the rest of the family would be just as happy. And and this is what I like to do is to do a glacier landing, which is to go set your feet on glacier ice. Oh uh, yeah. And then go look down in the crevasses and go stick your face in glacier water and then open your eyes. There's nothing more spectacular than that, life altering. Um, but you know those. Oh yeah, see. <laughs> Oh, he's so cute. Um, so, uh, but that's the only that's the only instance where I would say the end of the season is not the best time to come. Um, but and we like at Icy Straight Point, uh, we have whales all th all throughout the season. We do the whale guarantee, which is the only port in the world that gives one hundred percent of your money back if you don't see a whale. In our sixteen years of existence, we've never had to refund any money ever because the whales are there. Um, once the end of the season comes, you get a whole lot more bear count. Also, if you want to see orcas at Icy Strait Point, the orcas, the migrating pods come. Um, I have some amazing footage. If you go to IcyStraitPoint.com, you'll see it on the, the front page there of uh, these orcas, a migrating group of orcas coming through. And that happens at the end of the season. And if, you, if orca's on your list, you're going to want to be at Icy Strait Point at the end of the season. So. Now, one thing, uh, you, you know, you mentioned the uh, the dogs left up on the glacier, and certainly it is interesting because the year that we were there, apparently the, the notice went out, and every blogger friend of mine and, and Heather's uh, went to Alaska around the same time, and one of our friends was celebrating their uh, their honeymoon, and they, they spent, I mean, they were in a haven suite, and they did the helicopter tours, all that kind of stuff, and it was, yeah, I'd be, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit jealous, but Alaska 360 in uh, in Skagway also is a great opportunity for people who, who don't want to spend the money. And I, I don't know what those tours cost for the helicopter tours to the glaciers, but I'm guessing probably at least 300, if not 400, 500 bucks per person. Higher than that? Okay. Well, see, it, it, it's it, it's so far out of my budget that I just know that I can't afford it. <laughs> but Alaska 360, which, by the way, they, they did host us, so that was very nice to them. Is a great opportunity if you want to just go and you have some kids, or you want to just, you know not spend a whole day doing it. They actually ran a little course uh, on some gravel, and it's kind of it sounds hokey, but it was a great experience to kind of see what the dog sled teams look like. And yeah, you know what? You also get some really cute pictures holding little husky puppies, and that was that was worth the price of admission. Yeah, it so was actually led by um, it, it was actually led by people who do race and have won. So that was a good aspect of it. And they wanted you to hold the puppies to socialize them. Yeah. No, they do a great job at, uh, I, I refer to them as the dirty dogs um, because they're running on, on the dirt, but uh, those dogs are also in training. Most of the time when you see the dogs that are up on the glacier, those are, those are dog teams that you'll see the, the mushers that you're running with. You'll see those names and those dogs names listed in the Iditarod. Um, I mean, these are these are real dogs, and they love to run, and they're in training. And that's another. Heather, you talked about the importance of tourism, um, the importance of tourism for uh, mushers. You know, people that that's their livelihood. It gets fed through the summer to feed their dogs because they're eating. You know, the highest grade dog food. These are athletes. They're well trained athletes. You know, 
and they they support them through tourism throughout the summer. So all, all of these, um, you know, this Alaska, once again, I come back to, I'm just talking about it and I'm thinking, you know, when you come to Alaska, there's so many things to see and do. Um, and each port has something unique. So you get to plan your, your time and your day. And like you said, James, if, if a helicopter is not in your budget, you do have the opportunity to go see the dogs. Uh, but you really want to plan your schedule that you're going to get the most out of the Alaska experience. So. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I think one of the challenges that, that, that I have is that, yes, that each port is unique, but it's at the same time, a lot of the same excursions that are popular tend to be available at all the ports. You know, first, you, at, at pretty much any of the port, you can do a fishing experience, you can do a Jeep tour, you can do a hike. But I think, you know, it's really scratching below the surface is where you start realizing that, you know, a, a Jeep tour at Isis Strait Point isn't necessarily the same as a, as a Jeep tour in Ketchikan. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, James. I didn't know you were going to cue me up so nicely. But one of the things you have to know is that uh, we're the only Jeep tour in Alaska that's actually on dirt. So when you go drive, you're really going driving off road. So all the other Jeep tours that you would do are on paved road. We have the, the roadless rule uh, in Alaska. So there are really not very many gravel roads or dirt roads that you can go explore. So um, as you said, you have to look below the surface to figure out, hey, if I'm going to go on a Jeep tour, I really want to go off road and go see something. And uh, so that's where you're going to find a difference of, of the tour. Also, you're going to find whale tours. Uh, I, I understand now that there's even a whale tour down in, in Ketchikan. And the whale count in, in Ketchikan is that that's not known for that. So if I'm going to book a whale tour, I want to go where I'm going to see the large group of whales. Um, and the, also the other thing I want to look at is how many boats are in the water, you know, because you can go into ports where there are more than 60 whale boats in the water at one time. Whereas you come into a place like Icy Street Point and you have enough whales that you're, we have, you know, we might have three or four whale boats in the water but they're going in opposite direction because the whale count is high enough that you don't have to be around another boat. So, um, and to me, the other thing I like to think about too, is like you said, James, dig below the surface. When you got on a whale boat, to me, uh, whale watching is great, uh, but I wanna be boats that are designed for whale watching and I wanna be the closest to the water. Meaning, uh, you know, if you, can, if you can swing it, get on a boat, you know, we have these, uh, 24 passengers, we only put 18 people on, designed for whale watching, the windows come up to the inside, you're never out in the weather. And when the whale goes, poof, it's right into your face, you know what I mean? So you asked me, James, about crab, what does crab that, taste like? Cool. That tastes like crab. So, you know, you don't even have to, you know, I mean, you get the whole flavor and you'll never forget that. So to me, it's, it's when you're out there in the water that you'll never forget that sound and the closer you are to the water, the more real it becomes. So Basically, it's like going to a Gallagher show and being in the front row or the last row. Exactly. And so, and, and, and the, hopefully the people that are old enough to remember Gallagher, but you, you, James, you're dating yourself, uh, but you need to, you need to do a little digging. And I, I appreciate your show because this is the kind of stuff that people need to know is that when you see like, you know, that's the other thing that drives me just absolutely crazy is when you come to Alaska, the tour booklet is like this thick and you're like, what to do? Well, look at it. It's, you know, um, and it's really hard to choose. So by digging below the surface, you're going to get the best experience. And also, as I said before, each port in Alaska has a very unique, something very unique about it, something you can't do anywhere else in the world. So I, I really go after those things. Now, we've already said we're going to have you back to talk specifically all about icy straight point oh but yeah yeah well, I, I i we have we have really gone 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 off the off the rails no, haven't we? <laughs> no, 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 no. we've always said that we would you know talk about alaska because you know a lot about alaska and cruising so but then we do want to get to icy straight point so we're gonna have a whole episode on that but one thing i wanted to say is or ask on those lines is when we were in Ketchikan, we actually had an elder um, take us around and teach us a little bit about the totem poles and stuff like that. Now, I don't want to insult anybody because I really do not know that much on tribes and stuff like that. How many, there's different sections, right? Or is it just, 
if you can kind no, of tell so, so, so it's very, very interesting. In fact, for those historians, I, I really would encourage you to read up on what's called the Lands Act of 1972. Um, and the reason I say read up on that is that as we look at Native people around the world and Indigenous people, uh, Alaska is extremely unique because of the fact it's one of the only places that you can go. I mean, there's a few other places I can think of, Australia, New Zealand, you know, Mallory's, um, and then also your Alaska uh, Aboriginal people where you're visiting with direct descendants of people who have been there since time and memorial. So since the beginning of time, they've lived in those areas. So if you look at Alaska, there are 12 major divisions of tribal, tribal groups, if you would. So for example, we have in the South and Southeast, we have the, the, the Clinket. mostly you have Clinket, Haida, Simshian people that stretch from Ketchikan all the way up to Yakutat into where Hubbard Bay is. So that, so the core, and then, out of those 12 core groups, there are represented over 100, I think of the number, uh, don't quote me on it, but I believe it's 198 individual uh, smaller, what we would consider uh, tribal areas or village tribes that are represented. So when you come to Icy Street Point, you're meeting the Huna people and the Huna people are from Glacier Bay. Their descendants have been in Glacier Bay since, since the beginning of time. And they are still practicing the same traditions that they were back when they, they lived in Glacier Bay. Before Glacier Bay was Glacier Bay. It didn't have a glacier there. It was a fertile valley. It actually was called the hub of trade. Uh, the Huna people were called the hub of trade because tribes from the north and the south would come to this central location because it was such a fertile valley. There were so many berries and salmon that the trading there was, was great. And then we had the last minor ice age in the early 1700s, around 1730, and that created Glacier Bay. Mount Fairweather basically rose up. It caused um, uh, several years of straight snow. The snow buildup created uh, the massive Grand Pacific Glacier, pushed forward, carved out Glacier Bay into what it is today, and it moved the Huna people across the channel from, from Glacier Bay into Huna or Icy Strait Point. So, you know. Um, there, there's a great, very great and rich tradition of Aboriginal people. And to me, it's profound to go and visit a place where you're visiting the original people who are originally from that place. It's very moving. And I really encourage people to go and go with that mindset that you're meeting people that have traditions. You know, as we look at, as I said before, we've been in a themed reality. You know, we, we, we exist in these themed realities. And then you go to a place like Icy Street Point, it's not a themed reality. It is reality, right? It's existed since time and time memorial. And it's, it's very, very powerful. So, you know, you, I know that you visited with an elder down in, uh, in Ketchikan. One of the great things about Icy Straight Point is that when you walk around the site and you say to the lady who works in the coffee shop, she should say, who owns this? She's likely to say, I do. And that's because Icy Straight Point is owned by 1,450 Alaska Native shareholders who also work and make their, their living and livelihood at Ice Street Point. So, um, it, and it's really cool because they'll tell you about their family members who lived and fished there. Uh, the cannery that's in the image behind me today is, is been there since 1912. It was it's the centerpiece of Ice Street Point. It was the original dock location. It's a place where generations worked in the cannery. They canned over half a million cans of salmon there every year until 1952. So it's a very historical place, the original building. Um, and just over my, would be my right hand shoulder, my left hand shoulder is actually uh, one of the, the canning shops that's now has been converted into the, the crab house. So it's a place, James, that you'll love to visit. And it has the uh, the world famous Crabby Bloody Mary, which is a signature drink of, of Icy Straight Point. So it's like walking well, into history. I can trans... I guess if we transfer over to that, since we're close to the end, um, and we were talking about crab, and we talked about crab right before we went on, maybe you can tell us the good places to get crab in Alaska. Well, you have to remember that, uh, you know, crab in Southeast is relatively limited. So, um, then, and I, I say that because when you think of, of crab and Alaska crab, a lot of people think of the king crabs, you know, that you hold up and they're massive. And you will find king crab in Alaska, but most of it's getting shipped in from other places in Alaska. 
the Alaska crab that we have that's native uh, to Southeast is known as the Dungeness crab. So there you have, you have Dungeness crab. And uh, they're a little bit more work, but people who have Dungeness compared to king crab will go Dungeness every day of the week. So uh, this crab is, is locally, locally harvested. Um, and you'll find that, of course, we also have the traditional king crab at the crab house uh, at Icy Street Point. And you won't find the Crabby Bloody Mary anywhere else. Um, and the other cool thing I do like about Icy Street Point is the fact that uh, you can buy your drink and you can walk out of the restaurant and walk down the, down the boardwalk, find your own little piece of the beach uh, and enjoy it. You know, so very, very unique. Um, also, Juno, uh, another fam famous place is uh, Tracy's Crab Shack. Uh, Tracy is a, is a very good friend of mine and uh, a very good, good hearted person and, uh, does a phenomenal job as well. Um, and she, she's actually I more have. famous. Yeah. I she's famous the for the crab bisque. Yep. I was going to say she's very famous for the crab bisque. Um, I, I have been after the recipe. She will not break it out for me. Uh, but she has broken out some crab bisque to my house. So that that's, that's workable. Um, so, uh, that's very, very good. Um, and the other thing you can't forget with the crab bisque is the butter roll, because you get the butter roll with the crab bisque, it's enough to make you turn Alaskan. So that's, that's good. Um, and the other place I would mention too, is probably not very famous, uh, down in Ketchikan is called Dwyer's. And the reason they like it, uh, is for the fact that it's a place that you can sit and you can look down and watch all the people below you, uh, on the cruise dock. So it's kind of a fun, fun, it's a lighter, lighter atmosphere uh, place to go. Um, but if, if you wanted to, to do the, the, the crab tour, those are the places that I would go. And then when you get to Skagway, you have Thai food. I'm just saying. Yeah, you know, oh, it's really? funny enough how, you know, you're sitting in Alaska and also you're like, why is there Filipino restaurants and, and Thai restaurants and stuff? But then you realize that there's, you know, literally thousands of Filipinos and Thai and, and various other ethnicities that probably know like, hey, that's the place to go. Well, no, James, do you know how that came to be, though? I, I, I just assumed it was the cruise ships. Do you know why that is in Alaska? Why there's the, the large cuts of Asians on the ship? No, right? that would not be the case. Oh, we have to correct the, correct the history. Uh oh. Uh, so what has happened is you've had fishing fleets over many hundreds of years who have come to Alaska. So you had, we have actually a, a very high, like Norwegian population, people who are Norwegian fishermen who came because they heard about the great bounty of the salmon runs. The salmon, you know, back in, back in the day, the 1800s, this, the, you know, it's really, a, uh, this is a whole, we do a whole nother show about fishing techniques and fishing waters, but it brought people from all over the world to fish in Alaska. And once they came to Alaska, they fell in love with it. So you have uh, people that came from the Asian fishing markets that came to work in Alaska and to harvest fish in Alaska that said, I love this place. And they, and they made it home. So that's why you find uh, some of those, those restaurants and, you know, a, a lot of different diversity uh, throughout the entire state. It all goes back to, to the fish. I guess that, that makes sense. I'd never really considered that. Um, one of the questions I had is I forgot because we couldn't, we wasn't salmon time. We couldn't really have salmon, you know, and we could, but I didn't want to do that because I knew it was off season. Um, but we did have, is it haddock? What is the very halibut. popular? Halibut. Oh, oh my you gosh. had halibut. I had halibut yeah. everywhere. It was so good. Yeah. So halibut, and that's another one too. If you come to Icy Street Point, you want to get out and halibut fish. Um, some of the largest records for halibut have been caught in Port Frederick, which is the body of water that Icy Street Point sits on. And that's because the dock that you see behind me back in the fishing day, they would take all the fish guts and fish scraps and they would push it onto a barge. And then they would haul that barge out into the bay and then push that off into the water. And it just created these great feeding frenzies or feeding pools for the, the halibut. And halibut can get into, uh, you know, you're pulling up 300 pound fish. Um, they get, they're massive, massive. Um, it was and that so actually, good. But that actually, you know, takes me back once again, back to our, our Clinkett history and our Huna people. And that is that 
if you learn about them and they were, they were actually were fishing guides. That's why Ice Street Point was such a great fishing place is because of the fact what they did is they created a designed a fishing hook that was designed out of wood and it was weighted that would go down and only allow you to catch up to around a 50 pounder, 40 to 50 pounder, because the best tasting halibut is not those larger fish. It's the ones that are actually smaller. And the, and the reality of it is, is you want those larger fish because they're going to produce more offspring as well. So, you know, you, you need to keep the fish uh, population healthy and by harvesting those larger halibut. So over time and in tradition, we go back to what's the best tasting fish when you catch a fish of that size. You know, it's not the one that you want to keep. It's the one you want to throw back. You're catching the smaller ones. But uh, halibut fishing is very, very popular um, at Icy Street Point. And that's because of the the just massive numbers of halibut that are out there. It's kind of interesting that again, you know, the the more I the more I learn about Alaska, the more I realize how dynamic it is. And it's it's interesting because, for the most part, you know, with the exception of like if you're going snorkeling, for instance, in the Caribbean, it's kind of the same all year round. Like you're still going to have the senior frogs, and you're still going to have the you know the, the, <laughs> the, the swim up bars at the resorts and that kind of stuff. The water's going to be cooler or warmer depending on the season, but. For the most part, it's it's kind of the same all year round, but it seems like in Alaska, your experience is going to be radically different if you go in May versus, you know, September, October. And I think that's that's an element of Alaskan cruise that I I didn't really understand until, you know, to be honest, really this show. And I think that's that's really special. One of my favorite things about cruising is when you close your eyes and you wake up, you wake up in a different place. And when you cruise in Alaska, you close your eyes and you're going from port to port and you really do wake up in a different place. Um, totally different culture, totally different experience. Uh, in the Caribbean, you know, I, I've heard it said before, you know, you close your eyes and you wake up and you think you're in the same place because you're like, oh, did I just wake up in the same Caribbean island where I was at yesterday? Um, and I know each of those, uh, we could really do a deep dive too about different things that each island in the Caribbean has that are completely different. But it's just a different world, you know, as you move from Ketchikan in the south, the Misty Fjords, you know, it's the, it's the carving of the glacier valleys that really starts down in the Misty Fjords so that you're starting to sail into. And then up into to Clinkets and into Glacier Bay and the whole history there. Uh, Juneau into the Juneau Ice Field, Mindenhall Glacier, uh, Skagway, the, the history of the railway. You know, it's just a whole different different world. And then you move into into Seward and you get into the Kenai Peninsula, which is, is one of the most spectacular places in all the world to go visit with the Harding Ice Field. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, man, you make me want to go cruise, James. There we go, guy, James. <laughs> I, I would say, well, you're a whole lot closer, but the reality is we probably have cruise ships that are closer to us than you do right now to yourself. But uh, um, if I could uh, if I could commandeer one of these, uh, we have Celebrity Millennium and Celebrity Solstice sitting just off the coast here in San Diego. I would love to commandeer those and say, like, hey, guys, let's uh, let's head up and pick Mickey up. Well, I can't I can't wait to welcome them back to, to Ice Street Point, it's Alaska waters. I mean, it's it's going to be spectacular. Um, you know, I, I, I say that knowing every season is spectacular, but also it's, I, I think the 2020 season is just going to be really memorable. It really will be memorable. Uh, you, you, you think about, uh, what we've all been through and then to awaken your soul in Alaska, you'll remember this, that trip more than any other trip in the world. The, the, the one, the one trip that brings you out is, is going to be a, a life altering, you know, and I'll, I'll venture to say will be the best trip of, the, of, of your life wherever it is. But um, hopefully it's Alaska, but yeah, it'll definitely it'll definitely move you. Well, we are done for today, but we will definitely have you back because we want to know all about Icy Straight Point. And we will just do a whole discussion on it because everybody's talking about this port in Alaska and wondering, how do I get on a ship that goes there? And what is there to do there? And is there a high-speed gondola? We have not one, but two. We have. And when you uh, think of high-speed, you're not. People are not image. You, you're thinking of going super fast. So it's uh, quite no, they're, they're, they're they're pretty <laughs> they're pretty fast, but they're detachable cars. You get in and they move along. But uh, speaking of high speed, though, we also have the world's largest zip rider. So 
uh, for those adventure seekers. Um, awesome. Yeah, but you know, I, I uh, and uh, and we'll talk about more about the bears and the whales and stuff like that. But uh, you know, Ice Street Point is just one of those really unique places in the world where you get the best of both worlds. I think I referred to it earlier as the family port. And that's just because there's so many things that you can do together as a family that, as I talked about memorable experiences, um, you know, we, we, connect, we connect our memories together also with our families and to be able to do a zip rider where you can have the whole family line up all the way across. Um, it's a, an experience that you'll never forget or timeless experiences also like watching whales. I don't care how old or how young you are, you never forget it and, you ne and it never gets old. My daughter Kennelly uh, goes out with me on 11, 11 years old, has gone out with me season after season to see whales. And some of my favorite memories of her are sitting on the back of a whale watching boat with the rain just pouring down and her just sitting back going, just bring it, bring it, I'm ready. Like we're going to see whales. So it never gets old. They're timeless experiences, and that's really what you're going to find at Icy Street Point. Um, and I'll have to say this for my good friend Tyler. Uh, you'll see the dog there. Have you ever seen dogs bark at whales? Um, you're never going to see it anywhere else other than Icy Street Point. This this is the crazy thing about glacial, glacially carved waters is where that dog is. You can see he's only about uh, six inches in the water. Where the whales are, that's about 180 feet of water. So it drops off very, very quickly. So very, very deep vertical sidewalls, but uh, no place in the world do you see the whales come around. And uh, I'll tell you all about Freddie too next time we talk about Freddie, our, our, our whale that needs therapy. So Okay, awesome. Not, not Funship Freddie? What's that? Funship Freddie? No, not Funship Freddie. Uh, no, this is uh, actually his name's Frederick. He was named after Port Frederick because he's a loner whale that never leaves. But in fact, if you go to the Ice Straight Point page, you'll see a, a bubble net feeding that's in a spiral. And that's Freddie. Uh, he's learned to bubble net feed by himself. So um, he's a very, very unique. He's one of the only whales in the world that we know of that does this with the proficiency with all different types of food. So He's got a whole story. I'll tell you about Crooked Foot. I'll tell you about, yeah, like I got all kinds of great stories. Well, thank, so thank you, you guys again. for having me. Yeah. So I guess, James, it's time to say goodbye. Well, I'm going to hit the end broadcast button, but um, <laughs> Nikki, uh, definitely, if you could hang around a little bit, that would be awesome. Otherwise, uh, I'm not sure what our topic is for next week, but um, we're back in the uh, saddle again, as it were. So. <laughs> Great. And uh, also uh, for your viewers, I'll let you uh, download the map as well that I showed. So I'll send you that file. So for those people who can have awesome. that. Awesome. Great.